So, hi, I'm Angie Rizzi, and I've been working with Dr. Margaret Pippin on the air quality campaign. And we decided to take a new approach this year and look at um, being able to tell a story about our air. And we started in our last webinar talking about how can clouds tell an air quality story. And this week we'll be doing how do satellites add to the air quality story. So in order to tell that part of the story, we're going to talk a little bit about aerosols. And so Margaret is here with us today, and we also have a special guest, Dr. Christina Pistone, who you will see in um, part of the video. I pre-recorded a lot of the webinar so that we could avert any potential technical issues. So sit back um, and enjoy the video, and then uh, we'll take questions afterwards. Do, I, I can't tell if other people have their cameras on, but Margaret and Christina, if you just want to wave to people and let them see you, that would be great. And then um, we can start the video. So today, in the second webinar in our Globe Air Quality Campaign series, we'll be talking about how satellites add to the air quality story. And as part of that, we'll talk about what do aerosols have to do with clouds, why NASA is interested in the topic. We're going to look at some art related to aerosols. And I'll talk to you about how we can use the Globe Visualization Tool to get um, aerosol cloud and aerosol optical depth information and then take it further and look at using the public website aerosol watch to get more images. So again, it's um, myself, Angie Rizzi and Dr. Margaret Pippin, who's the scientist on this project that are working on it. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions for um, this campaign or project. We would also like to welcome Dr. Christina Pistone, who's joining us today. She's provided us with some great background information on aerosols, and she'll be here to answer questions today. So thank you, Christina, for joining us today. So to start off, I just want to talk about telling a story. And um, there is an artist named Kim Abels in Los Angeles who does a lot of different uh, really interesting artwork. And some of her artwork um, explores the environment, science literacy, and civic engagement. And in 1987, she developed a method to create images from the smog in the air. The smog is the aerosols um, that we're talking about today. And this is called Smog Collectors, and her work got national and international attention. So her method involves putting a medium with a stencil on it outside for some time period. And while it's out there, the smog or the aerosols will settle in on the medium. And uh, after it's done, she'll take the stencil off and you can see where the smog hit. You have the darker parts and where the stencil was blocking it, you have the parts that are not dark. And so this is a great way to um, be able to visualize the air quality and the aerosols in the air. And it goes beyond just numbers and data, which is what I really love about it. And these, um, these images on this screen here are showing some of her work. So I encourage you to um, think about what she's done and think about how this can relate to the next activity that I'm going to show you. And that activity is called What's Up in the Air? And it really uses a very similar principle except rather than creating an image, we collect the smog in a grid and count the visible aerosols. I'm gonna demonstrate for you how to do this, but as you watch, think about ways that you might be able to adapt this activity for your air quality story. So in order to do this activity, you need a few supplies, but they're simple. 
So you want some clear contact paper. You need a piece of cardboard. And you know, as long as it's as big as a regular piece of paper, it's fine. You, you don't have to have a specific size. You're going to want to have the two sheets from the globe activity, the one which is the sample grid and then the student activity sheet, which we'll be using in a little bit. You need some scissors to cut your contact paper, some tape, something to write with, and a number cube or dice. Okay, so we want to do this activity to try to catch some of the aerosols, which are particles that float in the air. Some aerosols are big enough for us to see with our eyes or maybe with a magnifying glass, but some are too small for us to see. So for this activity, we're only gonna be able to look at aerosols that we can see with our eyes or with the magnifying glass. So what we need to do is cut a piece of contact paper. Now I've already cut some here, and you just want to make sure that it is big enough to cover that grid, okay? As long as it's big enough to cover the grid, it's going to be a good size, but not bigger than the whole piece of paper, okay? Then I'm going to take my piece of cardboard, and I am going to take the contact paper, and notice I did not take the back off of the paper yet. And I'm going to put the back side facing up and I'm going to tape down the corners. And I only want to tape the corners. I don't want to tape all around all the edges. I just want to tape the corners so it will stay on the paper. But that's not sticky. To make it sticky, I have to peel the back off. And when I'm doing that, I'm gonna to have to get it started and I try not to put my fingers on the sticky part. So I try to keep my fingers on the corners and when I get close to one, I will put my finger down and go by and it's okay to leave a little bit of paper under the, a little bit of the back under the contact, under the tape, sorry. Okay, so this is what I did. I now have four corners, it's okay to have the back under them, and this is ready to put down and see if it can catch some aerosols. Well, you want to leave it for at least two hours and maybe even longer. So another thing, a couple things you can do to make this into a, an experiment is you could make more than one and you can put them in different places, or you can leave them for a shorter amount of time and a longer amount of time or something like that. Now, once it's done, and because we don't have two hours to wait, I already did this, and I already did two, and I've already finished them up, okay? So we're gonna use those in a minute. But let me show you what we'll do after we left it for a couple hours. So pretend that you left it there, and here's my sheet, and here's my sample grid. And I am going to lay the sample grid down on top of the sheet, making sure that the grid is over the sticky part. Okay, I'll stick it to there. And now I will take the contact paper off, and this is why I only wanted to tape down the corners because it would be too hard to take it off otherwise. And now the sticky side isn't up. But we can go and we have all these squares and we can count how many might be in each square, okay? So this is where we're going to now be able to use our student activity sheet. Now on the student activity sheet, you can record all kinds of things about what it was like that day. And you can check off the boxes. And I'm gonna show you how to fill in this table. And this is where the die is gonna come in. So if you notice here on the grid, we have the numbers from one to six going up on one side and then on the bottom they go from one to six. So you roll your number cube. I rolled a two, so I go down, I go up to the two, then roll it again three and I go over three, okay? I will look at this square now with my magnifying glass and I will see 
how many aerosols were in there. So if I use the one that I left out for a long time earlier, I have two aerosols in that, in that square, okay? And you do that 10 times with 10 different squares. So if you, if you roll the same square, then you don't wanna do that one again. And after you do that, I took this one and I did 10 squares and I put how many? And I had found 27 aerosols all together on this, see, on this collection sheet. And then I found the average by dividing my total of 27 by 10. And so on average, there were 2.7 aerosols that I could see per square on my collection sheet. So I hope you have fun doing this and please share with us if you do this activity. Now let's hear from Dr. Christina Pistone about aerosols. Hi everybody, my name is Christina Pistone. So I'm a research scientist at the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute. And so I work at NASA Ames Research Center in the San Francisco Bay Area. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about aerosols, how they affect clouds, why do we care about them, and what do they do? What are aerosols? Aerosol is a term that scientists use to mean basically any small particle or liquid droplet which is suspended in the atmosphere. So a lot of people hear the word aerosols and they think hairspray cans. That's an example of an aerosol. When you spray the spray can, it's putting little droplets into the atmosphere, but that's only one type of aerosol. And in earth science, we study a lot of different types of aerosols. So not all aerosols are the same. Some aerosols have a cooling effect. So some of them look white and they reflect sunlight back to space. Some of them are darker and they absorb sunlight, um, which heats the atmosphere. And what I do in my work is I study mostly these darker aerosols. So they absorb sunlight, they can heat the atmosphere, and this can change how clouds form under these conditions. So aerosols are very important for clouds. In order for a cloud to form, you can't just have water vapor in the atmosphere suddenly condense to form a cloud, clouds being liquid droplets. The water vapor in the atmosphere needs to have some small sort of seed to condense around, uh, which forms the cloud droplets. And that's what aerosols do. So aerosols act as these little cloud seeds, which allow clouds to form. And when we put more aerosols into the atmosphere or different types of aerosols into the atmosphere, it can change this process. And the aerosols that we as humans put into the sky can change the properties of clouds which form. So NASA wants to know more about air quality because NASA studies all of the planets and Earth is one of those planets. And it's one of the planets that we have the most data on because we are continuously looking at it. Um, so NASA has a bunch of satellites which are looking down at the Earth and measure cloud properties and aerosol properties. It's very important to be able to understand clouds and aerosols together because often looking from satellites, it's difficult to tell whether we're looking at clouds or whether we're looking at aerosols. And also sometimes from the ground, it's difficult to tell what we're seeing. So when we're talking about sky color or visibility, if the sky outside looks kind of gray and hazy, a lot of times that means that it's overcast, that we have clouds outside but it can also mean that there's a lot of aerosol in some conditions. So in certain places in the world, you will see very bad air quality, looks like a gray haze that kind of looks like clouds, but it's not really clouds. Uh, if you go and you dust your bookshelf, all of those particles which have landed on your books and have made this sort of dust layer those were all aerosols at one point. They came in on the air and they settled down onto your stuff where you dust them off. 
We saw something like that when we were in the field during Oracles, which was a NASA campaign. Uh, we were based in an airport which is very near to the desert, and so we saw a lot of aerosol come in as we were preparing for flights. Uh, the wind would bring in desert dust and it would settle onto our instruments and it was pretty pretty dramatic to see sort of little piles of dust. Uh, at home you might not see that unless you do live in the desert, but that's a, a really dramatic way to see how aerosols can settle out. Another way aerosols is removed is usually from rain. Rain is a very efficient remover of aerosols from the atmosphere, so when the clouds come through, uh, as I mentioned before, clouds can use aerosols to become the little seeds, the cloud condensation nuclei, for the cloud droplets, and they can also take those into the rain droplets, and as rain falls out of the cloud and onto the ground, it also can pull all of these aerosol particles out as well. So now that we've learned a little bit about aerosols and seen the aerosol catcher activity, I want to show you how you can use the globe visualization tool to obtain some information. So this would be the page you would land on when you get into globe.gov and you want to go under globe data and then click on visualize data. You'll see this screen here and you'll want to enter the visualization system. And this will pull up the globe visualization tool. So you can zoom in on whatever area you might want to be looking at. I'll be looking here at the United States. And there are several things that you can do. But since we're considering cloud observations and obscured skies, I'm going to come here this little uh, hamburger type thing which has the protocol layers and I'll select atmosphere and then I will come down to clouds and just select cloud cover and then submit. And notice it will pull up the cloud observations for the current day. So if you have a day that's of particular interest to you you can come up here to the date field and click on it and it will pull down a menu and I'm going to go back to September of 2020 and start around the 10th. And if you notice here on September 10th there are quite a few observations out in California that have the dark circles there are a couple as you move across the country and there are even some out east. So it makes me wonder if perhaps there was something going on. And what you can do if you want to investigate a particular um, dot is you can click on that and what will come up is a field here that gives you some information about the measurements, data counts, site information, and photos. We would be most concerned with measurements and photos. Here in this measurement, we see that it says obscured, and it says smoke is true. So that means that the observer said that there was smoke obscuring the sky. Now there may or may not be pictures for that, so we can click on photos. Now we're on September 10th at 2129, and here on September 10th at 1950, we have some pictures. Now as I look at these pictures, it doesn't particularly look, this could be smoke. I can't be 100% sure looking at the pictures if this is smoke. I can come down here at 2129. I see there are some additional pictures. Okay. And maybe that's smoke and maybe it's not. It might be hard for us to tell. Well, that brings me to the next point then.
So we have some clues. We can go through and look at multiple observations and see what the pictures are showing us. But we can also add a base layer. So here, if you click on the three dots, you can choose a base map. And there are a couple different things we can choose. We can look at the true color, which is going to show us things like clouds. Okay. Sometimes we might see smoke. This here looks to me like it is smoke. Okay. So we might see smoke or clouds in these images. Now, one thing I will tell you is we can also put on aerosol optical depth. An aerosol optical depth is a measure of aerosols that um, tells us how many um, aerosols are in the total column of air from the ground up to the instrument. And if there are clouds in the way, we really can't make that measurement. So notice if I switch back and forth here that um, where there are all these clouds, Okay, you see there are so many clouds covering the country on this day. I won't see very many aerosol optical depth measurements where all those clouds were. And that's because those measurements can't be made. But we do see some here. And if we come down here to the legend and we click on base map, you can see the color key. So really uh, anything beyond the green is certainly going to be some polluted air. So these, these dark red colors and these yellows are definitely polluted air and could be indicative of something like smoke. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. The next thing I'll show you is how we can look at multiple days at a time. If I click on this video camera here, I can go from, let's say, I'll start with September 10th, where we are, and go through September 18th. And now I can step through these days. Okay. So notice the correlation here between these really dark aerosol optical depth colors and some obscured images, some obscured observations. And we keep going. Notice movement across the country here. And I'm going to go back through these days now. And this time I'm going to switch it to the true color. And we're going to see the difference in the clouds. And do you think that you're seeing smoke here on the 14th? And look at what we see here for the aerosol optical depth. Okay. And we again, it looks like we're seeing a lot of smoke. We can switch. There's the aerosol optical depth. So these are some things that you can do with the visualization tool that can help you identify smoke and aerosol optical depth. And the next thing I want to show you is aerosol watch. So here's the aerosol watch site. And when you come in, like the globe visualization tool, it's going to pull up the current day. And it's also going to just pull up the United States. Now, when you first come into this site, if you notice the layers over here on the right, it's always going to default to the Geo 16 color layer being on. 
when you see the different layers that you can turn on and off, if the layer is green, then it's on. If the layer is red, then it's off. So this is uh, something where we can see the clouds. So let's again go back to September 10th. which we were looking at in the globe visualization tool. And we are seeing some images here that are showing us the clouds. And you can see sometimes it takes a moment for the image to load. So the next thing that we wanna do is I like to go down to the labels layer and I like to put the boundaries on. I can see the state boundaries that way. If you put the labels on, it'll give you the state names, but sometimes that can be a bit busy. So if you don't need that, I like to leave that off. So now you can see the states and you can see the images. So the next thing we can do is go into VIRS layers. So VIRS is um, the instrument and they're on different satellites. And we can come in and we can turn on the AOD map. So remember, that's our aerosol optical depth. And I'll turn that on for both of these. And you see the scale up here. So when you get up into sort of these teal, yellow, orange, and red colors, we're starting to have dirty air. And clearly these red colors are, are, there's really something significant going on. Okay, so just for a moment, I'm gonna turn these off again. Um, reminder that when you see these clouds, you won't see AOD where the clouds are. So do you notice that? So the nice thing about this compared to the globe visualization tool is that we can see the clouds and the AOD together. And I'm going to turn on fire. So you see here, there's something called fire. And you can put that on for both VIRS instruments. If we turn the geocolor off, we can see where the fires were indicated. Again, it takes a little time to load our boundaries back on and there you see the fires. These can be hard to see when you also have the geo color on because you have all the lights at night. Okay, so that's why I turned the color off. We can also add smoke and dust. So where the instruments are detecting smoke and dust, we can see it there on the screen. And if we want to get really, didn't mean to do that. If, if we want to get really fancy, we can put the AOD on with the smoke and dust and we see that they align quite well. The benefit of putting the smoke and dust map on top of the AOD is that you can see that the AOD is in fact smoke or dust. You can have AOD without those, so putting them together helps you build a more robust picture and have more confidence in the fact that what you're looking at could be smoke or dust. If you want to pull up another day, what will happen is you will have to reset all of your layers again. So you'll have to go back in and put the boundaries. You notice there's some clouds here. We'll go in, we'll put in fires for both, maybe take off the color, look at the AOD, the smoke and dust for both of these instruments. And you see there's a great agreement and you can see the fi where the fires are. And like here you see all these fires and all of this red right next to it and smoke and dust. You can put the color back on and you see that where the clouds are, we're not seeing 
the smoke or dust or AOD. It doesn't mean there isn't any there. It means the instruments can't see it through the clouds. Okay, and if we were to try to look at another day, we're going to have the same issue. I like to look at the 15th. That was a particularly interesting day. So I'll put my boundaries on. Not as many clouds on that day, although we have a, what looks like some pretty big storms here. We'll look at the fires. We'll look at the AOD. smoke and dust and you notice where are you not seeing it you're not seeing it here where where these clouds are it's much further north this time we'll take the true color off so you you can really see things that are going on and you can see the impact of the clouds potentially on where the smoke and stuff will go as well and the fronts. So hopefully this has helped you. Uh, the nice thing about both of these tools, the Globe Visualization and Aerosol Watch, is that you can go back and get previous dates. Whereas for Purple Air, which we looked at last time, you can't go back on the map and get previous dates. You can download data. And we will be talking about a little bit more in-depth use of Purple Air next week, as well as how to download those Purple Air data and the EPA um, smoke and fire map in the next webinar. So thank you, and hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions. I saw some good questions in the chat as we were going through, and I see some of them have been um, answered already, but I think we should go through them anyhow. Um, uh, Tracy asked when we were talking about the globe visualization tool if the AOD was the average for the day, and Margaret indicated that it's actually on the Terra um, satellite, so it's polar orbiting, so we're getting really just a one measurement um, during the day. So it's not a continuous. The, uh, Christy asked if we could pick up wood smoke trapped in an inversion and Christina let us know that since AOD is a column measurement, it can pull up, the, it can detect the aerosols wherever they are. What it cannot tell you actually is the height of those vertically, unless they we have an airborne sun photometer, which that sounds really cool, that she said that they have out at Ames. Um, Tracy asked if uh, it's detecting smoke and dust by particle size, and I'll let either Margaret or um, Christina answer that question. Are you guys both on mute? Uh, I was. Um, yeah, <laughs> I was. I was just. I, I'm not the most familiar with those products, but I. I believe what they do is they. So they have different wavelengths that they're measuring at, and using that. And I think they may also incorporate uh, larger scale models to say where things are coming from, um, to to get a better idea of the the type of the aerosol that we're looking at, whether it's smoke or whether it's dust. But but you can do it based on size. It's just difficult to get from a satellite like MODIS, a satellite instrument like MODIS or VIRS. Although, please correct me, Margaret, yes. if I said that wrong. <laughs> well, I, think that, I think that sounds good. 
Um, and, and Kathleen um, in the chat has also reminded us that the Calypso uh, satellite, you can get uh, altitude for the aerosols. So with yeah, the modus, if you have a LIDAR, that's really good. So but how, how often? Get, sorry, Angie, the, the modus you just get um, uh, a single value for the whole column and you don't know where it is in, in height in that column. But with the Calypso, uh, you can actually find the altitude for the aerosol. But how often can you find a Calypso measurement for a specific location? It's, it's not even every day, right? It doesn't go over every place. Right, so, okay. Yeah, the track is not over every single place. Um, with Tracy's question, I wasn't sure I understood. She was asking about whether it was an average. I wasn't sure whether that meant an average in the column or an average per day. So Tracy, if you can type something in to clarify your, your question. Okay, from the column. It's, it's basically a total, a total number in the column, isn't it, Christina? Yep. Yeah, it gives, it gives one value for the column. And, and another interesting thing about Calypso is, so, so Calypso is still mostly part of the A-train. So it's orbiting, following behind Aqua, which has a MODIS instrument. So we do get like mostly coincident kind of measurements. I believe they're like 15 minutes off of each other. Um, but Calypso has a much smaller footprint because it's, you know, shooting a laser and coming back. So we can get like a bit more information if we combine these different types of measurements together. But MODIS has a big footprint. Calypso has a small footprint because it's shooting a laser and waiting for it to come back and telling us vertical information. But yeah. So Christy asked, how does MODIS measure smoke and dust during the polar north when sunlight is limited? She said she knows of educators who have had troubles with globe sun photometer in Alaska in the winter. I do not know the answer to this question. <laughs> That, yeah, that's a, I think that's a limitation of MODIS, particularly in the polar regions. One pro that the poles do have is that because the A-train, so Aqua and Calypso are polar orbiters, you, you do get more overpasses in the Arctic. So I think, especially during polar night where there's no sun, you can actually get better resolution and you have more overpasses in the Arctic. So Calypso is a really good tool there because you you don't have the backscatter off of the surface. So basically like a noise that that you have in other places during polar night because there's no sun. So um, that that's definitely a limitation of MODIS, particularly when there's no sun in the poles. So Lisa asked, she says, we have a project where a large container ship is being disassembled in the Savannah region port that enters the mouth of the Atlantic Ocean. The wind direction would transfer aerosol particles toward the Charleston Harbor Atlantic Ocean waters. Is this possible to track? Um, without knowing more about the project, I'm not sure. But um, one thing that I'm not sure that you talked about too much, Angie, was the AirNet um, network, which are ground-based sun photometers. So there may be an AeroNet uh, instrument somewhere near Savannah where you can look at the ground-based measurements. It, it also has the limitation of it doesn't give you aerosol where there's cloud because it's measuring basically the total optical depth and then you can't tell what's cloud and what's aerosol. Um, so that might be something to do there. But other than that, if you don't have dedicated instruments, um, it may be a bit difficult, but you could certainly try to do it from satellites, I think. I don't know if that yeah. answered the question. <laughs> My opinion from having done something, having done projects with my students is you can certainly try. Um, depending on what kind of aerosols they are and how many there are, um, it 
might not have a huge impact on the total column measurement. And so it may or may not be something that's easy to detect. And then we will be talking in our next webinar about purple air instruments, um, which are more of a ground-based measurement. And so it's possible that they may detect something. There's a little bit of bias in those instruments, but um, there's some work being done on that. So it's something that you could try to look into, but it may or may not be easily detected. What, and this is from Christy. Christina and Margaret, what advice do you have for youth and undergrads who want to get into air quality related careers? Well, my first thought is take as much math and science as you can. And uh, Margaret, can you talk a little louder, please? Uh, take as much math and science as you can possibly take. And, um, you know, NASA off also offers internships. So apply for that or, or other agencies do as well, like EPA and such, if you're interested in air quality. Uh, Christina, you have any other, any other advice? <laughs> I mean, I sort of fell into this career. Um, I went into college knowing that I enjoyed science and that I liked doing it. So I started as a physics major. Um, eventually I did a summer kind of internship, like a, a summer research program at UCLA, which was in astro astronomy, astrophysics. Um, and then I, I basically just, I, I took a class in the physical climate system and thought that that was very interesting. And it was an application of physics that I hadn't really considered before and thought it was cool. Um, so I applied to grad school and ended up there. So I, I would say just follow your interests. I mean, don't, don't be too focused on the ending goal and just kind of go where, where it's, follow your interests and and hopefully there will be people along the way who will help you get there because I definitely benefited from having a lot of good mentors along the way. Yeah, I, I know you I think I have a, a similar story, uh, Christina. I you know did an undergrad in chemistry and you know fell in love with physics and so went on and did you know masters in physics and uh, then discovered atmospheric science. You know, it, you know, it was basically physics and chemistry that brought me to atmospheric science. So, so there's many, many paths to get to air quality as a career, many paths. Yeah, and, and I really appreciate having the background in physics that I had, because I, most of what we do is physics or chemistry. And then you can get into whether biology is involved as well, but it, it's all fundamental science and then you just kind of apply it. And for me, it was really useful to have that sort of background. You don't, you don't have to specialize in atmospheric particles from the very beginning. You can sort of see where, see where things take you. Maybe you'll find something else that's more interesting to you than aerosols. If I may <laughs> add, I like even, if, even though I wasn't asked. Um, <laughs> also, um, I would say encourage encouraging people that they don't have to be experts from day one and they don't always have to have straight A's all the time because um, as a teacher in the classroom, I often saw um, students mentally closing doors for themselves because they didn't consider themselves to be the top academic students. And um, I, I think that that's just a really important thing to help them realize. I mean, yes, they have to take these classes and they have to work hard and learn the material, but they don't always have to be um, at the very top. So, and if they're really interested, they'll be willing to do the work to, to get there. Let's see. 
Yeah, I did put a link in the chat for just the video part that was part of this webinar that um, hopefully you you can look at that if you want. I know you might be wanting to share it with some other teachers and you won't have to wait for the whole recording of this webinar to be out. Eventually, this will be up on the GLOBE um, YouTube channel along with the first one. Um, Emily is asking if there are any good articles or readings about what clouds and satellites can tell us about air quality. Emily, could you clarify maybe what level are you talking about? Because I'm sure there are plenty of scientific publications, but are you so you're talking about maybe high school level materials? I'm trying to think. I know there have been, since the whole COVID thing started, there were a whole bunch of people looking at how air quality has changed when we, various places went into lockdown. So there, there was a bunch of popular articles and a bunch of eventually academic publications looking at how nitrogen dioxide, which is not an aerosol, but air quality has improved when people stopped doing as much things as they were doing. Um, I don't have them right off the top of my head, but Tropomi is the instrument, which is actually the European instrument, which is a little bit better than the NASA instrument, which is OMI, which is older. Uh, maybe you guys know more about particular references. I'll try to find some. Yes, and Tempo will be going up very soon. Hopefully. Margaret, you're not loud. Tempo will be going up in 2022. And so we'll be doing it. Yeah, everybody's space. talking about tempo. Yes. Very excited. Okay, Margaret's clarifying that her training was in tropospheric chemistry, not aerosols. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, I assure you that you know much more about aerosols than I do. <laughs> well, um, just, you know, that you never stop learning, right? When we're in the in the science field, we're always learning, trying new things. Um, I'm fairly new to working with aerosols. You know, I, I really did my studies in air quality, but it was on the gas phase side of things. So... Just always keeping that in mind for, for the students that uh, you know, you're not stuck in one thing when you make a decision. You can always keep learning and keep, keep doing new things. That's a great point. So if there are no more questions, our next webinar, which will be on December 15th, we will be talking more in depth about purple air, um, how you can tell if it's a good sensor, how you can download the data, um, which is a way that you can go back in time and get some information. And then we'll be talking about the EPA fire and smoke maps, um, which are another real time source of information. So you have to try to scoop in there and get web shots when they're available. But uh, hopefully that will be interesting. Oh, great. Christina just put a link for a paper that was in there. And um, I, I, um, I'm really glad everybody came today. I appreciate your time. Does anybody else have any questions? Looking forward to seeing people's results. We can uh, put a teaser out there too for a, a webinar that hasn't been advertised. Um, we're thinking of a fifth webinar and I heard some, uh, some of the instruments mentioned today that and ideas that we would like to touch on. Um, we talked about the Aeronet instrument today, sort of briefly mentioned. Um, and I think someone 
you know, we're looking at the in situ uh, aerosol PM 2.5 data. We'll be talking about that next week, but also um, using some other tools, possibly like high split, so that we can look at back trajectories if you're looking at where the wind is coming from and how the how the aerosols are being transported. So stay tuned, stay tuned. Yes, and I thought that might be particularly interesting to the teacher who, or the person who mentioned the ship being disassembled. Um, so yeah, right. Lisa, that, that might be particularly interesting. That's actually the kind of thing I have done before. I'm just gonna put my email in the chat once more in case anybody has any questions. And I do wanna thank um, Christina and Margaret for joining us today, especially Christina, because um, I know that you're not necessarily working on this campaign, but we really appreciate your input and your expertise. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks guys. Yes, thank you very much.